with St. Paul, the fan. Just in case you missed it, it's Top 5 Sports Talkers of the Day. Now, it's time for Dan Barrero's Top 5 at 5, driven by Borton Volvo, America's most awarded Volvo retailer. Big basketball night tonight in the Twin Cities and uh, involving, I guess you could say, Minnesota-based teams, correct? Yes, and we'll get to that in a minute. Ooh. Because there's a lot to unpack on this streaming deal. And I'll just preface it by saying... I don't have a ton of information, and I don't have a ton of answers. Are we going to mislead listeners then? I don't think so. Okay. But CNBC earlier today was the first to report that ESPN, Fox, and Warner Brothers Discovery are going to join forces on a new sports streaming platform sometime this fall, which essentially means... ESPN, ESPN2, ESPNU, SEC Network, ACC Network, ESPN News, ABC, Fox, FS1, FS2, BTN, TNT, TBS, True TV, and ESPN Plus will all be in the same bundle. So if you are an ESPN Plus subscriber, yeah, right. you get them all. Okay. If you are a Hulu subscriber, you get them all. If you are a Max subscriber, you get them all. The sin- it's basically you're paying What's for- the catch? I don't know if there is a catch. got to be a catch. Well, the catch is, this is going to be a big bundle. So that means the price on the bundle is going to go up. You would think. Yeah. And then if you have your so Netflix. So what is it going to be, like 90 bucks a month? I don't know. Yeah. And that info is not out there yet, but Funny. a lot of cynics are saying, a lot of people that work in television, yes. and we've talked about this forever, at some point all of this is going to come together and you're going to go, this is, with all these different streaming services that I have to get now, Yes. doesn't it feel a lot like cable? And that's what a lot of people are saying about this one. I mean, it literally is. It's like a cable package only for sports fans because you get essentially everything, pretty much everything except the NBC properties, which I'm sure you can, you know, you know, Peacock will be available for that. (laughs) Gophers are on Peacock tonight. Right. But anyway, that's pretty big news that ESPN and Fox are partnering together. And obviously Warner Brothers is part of that as well. So this is going to be interesting to see what happens. And how quickly is this going to come out? This fall, they said. Okay. Which is quick. Yeah, it's not yeah, it's already uh, when you February. think about it. Yeah, correct. Um yeah, Disney jumped in with a statement. Fox jumped in with a statement. Warner Brothers jumped in with a statement. More details including pricing will be announced at so, a later date. If you're somebody like me and has direct TV or somebody like you that has, has Comcast Xfinity. or yep. Xfinity, why is this good for us? Because we already get those things. What, what's what's the advantage? It's not necessarily good for us. It's not really for us. It's for the streamer, the cord cutters out I there, see. essentially. Okay. Who have been trying to figure out how can I, you know, do I go to YouTube okay. TV so I can watch this? Do I go to Hulu so I can watch this? You know, yeah, I have Xfinity. I probably always will. And so all these channels are obviously a part of that. But if you want... Well, it sounds like we got a lot more to flesh out. Yes. Yeah. But it's interesting that they're all joining forces. Because they're also is, all com- uh, they're competing ba- for stuff. Is Bally in on this deal? I didn't see anything with Bally. Okay, that's the other thing. And it's officially now with the. I mean, the twins and Bally are they're, they're back to reunited, and it feels so good for one more year. Correct? Yes. And we don't yet know what a check they're going to cut for us. Is that correct? That we hasn't don't. been reported. Hasn't been reported. Okay. But I think it will be reported. Well, a lot soon of people because of the bankruptcy stuff. It's going to be public at some point. The cord cutters are bitter in that in with that news too, right? Because the cord cutters had help that they. They could get that there'd be some sort of streaming option through Bally on Twins games, for example, that does not exist, right? That's still not part of this deal, I don't believe. Well, it's just Bally's. Yeah. Yes. There's not another one. But yeah. there, well, the, well, yeah, so Bally, you're saying by definition, couldn't have, couldn't be made available to people. Bally is only through having direct TV or, 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 Cable or Comcast or yes. whatever. Well, Xfinity. But you can also get the Bally streaming app, which has been not but great. I, I, oh, okay, I thought that there wasn't an app option. No, there is. There is, but it just yeah. wouldn't. What people were hoping for is it wouldn't be Bally. That there'd, there'd be, be another, another option. Okay. Yes, and it seems like for this year that Bally is the only option that it's going to be. Because people have had issues with it. They've had trouble with it. Yeah. I mean, even these apps, the streaming stuff, I know, okay, boomer me, but, you know, I'm in Lansing on Sunday. And I'm. I wanted to watch League Pass. I right. wanted to watch the Wolves. Who'd we play? Rockets. Right. Yeah, I wanted correct. to see if Finchie was going to get it. And it didn't work very well on my phone. Like I'm trying to get the Wolves feed on my phone. I'm switching to the Wolves feed on yes. my phone. And it's cool because they have an in-house feed, so I can see um, our guy John Barry, mm-hmm. who's going to uh, Indy to to do the the Saturday stuff. So I'm watching all of John Barry's like 
halftime show hit stuff. I'm like, I don't want to watch. But you John can't Barry. see the game. I, I couldn't see the game very well. It was strange. It was, so I put strange. it on my laptop yeah. and I was able to grab it. But there's just it always seems like there's some kind of glitch or issues with a lot of this stuff. Well, my and point I don't think is, it was user error. On the Bally app, like you say, the fact that they have a streaming option, if it doesn't work, it's been incredibly unreliable, that's not going to satisfy very many people. No, it who is wanna, Who want to not have to mess with the channel. Like via DirecTV or Xfinity. I want to say that was like twenty bucks a month too. Yeah, you're the right. Valley I think that's right. App. Yeah, and so I mean that's a lot to pay for literally just to watch well, the Twins all month, especially if it doesn't doesn't function consistently. Right. Um, speaking of streaming apps, Peacock. If you want to watch tonight, you can listen right here on the Fan KFAN. Our pregame show at seven thirty. It's free, free, free. We're not asking you for three ninety nine. You can just listen right here on the Fan or KFAN on your iHeartRadio app. Minnesota Golden Gophers, 14-7 and seven on the season, 5-5 five and five in the Big Ten, hosting Tom Izzo and the Michigan State Spartans, 14-8 and eight on the season, and 6-5 and five in Big Ten play. Gophers are wearing their black uniforms tonight. I know you're always concerned about that. Big. But you look at the, uh, the Big Ten standings, Michigan State and Northwestern are tied for fourth right now, and the Gophers a half game behind them. Technically, I guess, in sixth place in the Big Ten. So a win over Michigan State would keep them in the top half of the conference. Uh, are we um, relatively healthy? I think we're good. I think we're good. I mean, Payne's really the big. Yeah. You never. He's kind of like game to game well, because of the back. So the back is the is a chronic issue that is why the head coach has said he's needed to manage minutes. Is that correct? Yes, and practice time and all of those things. But everybody else, I think, is good to go. Uh, what time we start tonight? 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock. Well, so it must be the second game of a doubleheader? It is. Do you know what the first one is? I think it's Ohio one? State, Indiana. Does Ooh. that sound right? No. Who knows? Is it your Hoosiers? Possible. Hoosiers are... Rosie and I were looking it up before the They're show. struggling a little bit compared to what they were supposed to be uh, in. Uh, is this year two for Woodson or three? I think, I think this is year three. Is it year three? Yeah, Man, I'm pretty time. sure. Time uh, yeah, Ohio sure. State is hosting the Indiana Hoosiers tonight. Uh, I'm going to say the spread for tonight I'm going to say Michigan State by two. Let's go to the DraftKings Sportsbook here. Golden Gophers odds. Might take me a second. All right. Michigan State, three-point favorite. Three-point favorites. Okay. All right. They're ranked 22 in the net. This would be the biggest victory, I think, numerically yes. for the Gophers all season. Uh, Northwestern was, or yeah. is, as yep. of now, right, in terms of the net numbers, whatever yep. that, whatever that's worth. Uh, the Minnesota Timberwolves, you can hear on the Timberwolves channel of your iHeartRadio app. Here's a comparison. We were just talking about <clears throat> the streaming stuff. My mom just texted me because she's going to watch the kids for us tonight because so we're going to go to the game. And she wanted to make sure that we had Peacock. I said, do you have Peacock? I said, yeah, I have Peacock. She said, good. I didn't want to have to figure out how to try to get it so I could watch the game tonight. Whoa. Do you know what she's never asked me? How do I get to Timberwolves channel on the iHeartRadio app? Because it's just that easy. <laughs> It's just that easy. It's just that free. We talked about it driving back from yeah. Iowa, listening to Wolves Lakers. It does seem simple to me. My mom this fired point, it up in the car. We listened to Wolves Lakers somewhere on I-35 as we were coming back up north. But it is the Wolves and Bulls tonight from the Windy City, the house that Jordan built. 6.45 pregame, 7 o'clock tip. And Levine is out, I think, now for the while, season. Right? Yeah. He's going to yeah. do, uh, he's getting surgery. foot surgery. Uh, so he's his whole career has it's gone pear shaped. There's no question about that. They're still capable of um, you know causing some trouble. In fact, they they played. There were stretches where they've played really well without them. I haven't checked lately what they have uh, been up to. Do you think now we're just going to take a deep breath that because we already got the victory we needed? To we better get not. Finchy we better not. The chance to coach. No, that, that wouldn't be good. I would not like seeing or hearing that. Let's not. Uh, how many games we got left for the All Star break? Two. It's just I think Bulls and um, no, we've got Bulls Nuggets. No, uh, what am I looking at? Are you familiar with the the latest what is that? NBA scandal involving a towel? Yes, with LeBron. We'll save it's it. Maybe get into it a little. It's just. It's already it's starting. Remarkable. It's, it's not good. It's, it's re it's stunning. Uh, we've got a handful of games before the break. Oh, and it's they're all on the road essentially because we've got Chicago, Milwaukee, the Clippers, and then back to back in Portland before the break. It looks like so. Okay. There you go. So Our next home time. game is the Friday the twenty third against Giannis.
and the Milwaukee Bucks, which got flexed to nine o'clock. You saw that, right? Did we talk about? Yes, that? we did. Uh, well, somebody did. It got flexed um, at nine uh, because of ESPN pickup. By the way, the Bucks are one and four under Doc, the All Star head coach. They gave up, I think, against Salt Lake against Utah. They gave up something. I think they had scored something like forty to thirteen. Yeah, in the fourth quarter the other night, forty points. So the moral of the story is they still can't guard anybody. They couldn't guard anybody under their previous coach, Aiden Griffin, and they still can't guard anybody. So we'll see um, when the Bucks decide to give Doc a vote of confidence. You know, it was really funny. First of all, it, they have to have a better mechanism than to allow Doc to coach the All-Star game. I would that tend to agree. Yes. I know he's going to give the money to Griffin, which, thank you, have some decency. But I think it was when I was in Lansing, I was watching you know, one of the NBA shows, and Austin Rivers is on the panel. Yes. And that's obviously a tricky situation to talk about his dad because they're just ripping the bucks, basically, and going, and they can't guard anybody either. And what do you think Austin said? He goes, oh, yeah, I mean, doesn't really matter the coach if the personnel is going to be the personnel. It's like, well, yeah, that's what we said. That's what everybody said when you traded Holiday away and brought in Dame. You were going to give up something. So why nice. is anybody surprised? Offense for defense. Nobody is, but uh, they, you got to do something. Fan of the Big Ten Basketball Tournament. want to give you a shot to put a grand in your hand. It is our National Cash Contest, and the keyword is Bills for the 5 o'clock hour. Go to KFAN.com and enter the keyword Bills. Uh, a couple of more mass transit uh, texts to get to, and maybe a little bit about this uh, Towelgate event, which is so soap opera-ish and so NBA. Stay tuned. 3 KFAN. If you want to let your Valentine know that they are the best, get them a gift card to Woodhouse Spa. Head over to our contest page, register for your chance to win a $100 gift card to Woodhouse Spa. KFAN.com, keyword contest to enter. There is some bitterness uh, via the uh, text line that you didn't the, um, the tease regarding Timberwolves trade rumors. And that's fair. I think... That's a tantalizing tease that that people say I need to I need to get paid off there. So what is Johnny? Is this mainly Johnny tweets? It's mostly just Johnny Athletic on the Johnny Clickbait story behind the paywall. Johnny Paywall ah. throwing out the names. Uh, he does say the Wolves and Wizards have discussed Tyus Jones. For those that are wondering. Among many teams that apparently have expressed interest in Tyus Jones. Washington is believed to be looking for a first round pick in return for We don't him. have any. We've given them all to Utah, so we can't really do that. I, I think, think so. the report was we offered them like 12 seconds, I think. Well, here's the other thing I have heard is they, it's the old, um, yeah, we'll take Nas Reed. Not going to work. That so far, what's being asked in return is so preposterous that it might lessen the chance that something actually gets done. The hope is as you get closer that people get more realistic um, because here's the question. I think you have to be prepared to trade, to trade slow-mo. I think you have to, whether you want to or not. Interesting. I really do. Now, Cause I, I, you, you obviously aren't going to trade McDaniels. You're not going to trade Nas Reed. And I don't think you should trade Alexander Walker. So, but you got to give up something. Yeah. So unless it, you can get it done all picks, well, which that's is unlikely, true, which is unlikely, which means I think, um, and I, I still like the security blanket of him, even though his shooting has become obviously problematic and people don't, they don't even bother to guard him. And that can yeah. hurt you offensively on a team that's offensively challenged already. But I think that's got to be one of the guys. And I believe he's got one year. So it'd be the old, um, last year of his contract. Expiring, expiring contract. contract. Yeah, right. that's the asset there. And I don't have the stats in front of me, but anecdotally, I know he's not been shooting well, but it doesn't even feel like he's finishing at the rim like he did a no, year ago. No, I agree. It feels like when he got to the rim and he does that little post-up move and he kind of you know slow-mos his way down to the lane, mm -hmm. I feel like he doesn't even make those shots with the same frequency. Monte Morris is another possibility. Played for Conley in Denver. Wolves have had discussions on several fronts yeah, with the that's Pistons. Name. Yep. And that's um, one way that they could go. And then it's uh, Dennis Schroeder, the guy who hit mm -hmm. the dagger three in the play-in game, which I'm petty. I, I don't... I When he did the three and then he did the, you know, injected into my veins thing with LeBron. Yes. I, I don't want him on my team. I just don't. It's, that still bothers me. You're talking about Schroeder? Yeah. Yeah. He, well, there, there's a little bit... I'm that's, just mad because he beat us. No, but to be honest, I think there's a little bit of a wild card factor with him that, from a personality standpoint, on a team that at least in terms of coaching and being, you know, coachable, uh, they 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 kind of like the mix. I think 
He can he can do some stuff for sure. You just have to be. There's a little more volatility there. I think he will likely be on the move, as will possibly Kyle Lowry via trade. Well, that's another name I've heard. Or yeah, buyout. Well, I think what you're tending to hear so far is more likely that the Wolves try to acquire a point guard via trade and a scorer or slash shooter versus buyout. Now, in Lowry's case, you could say, well, you're kind of getting a little of both because Lowry can run a team. Yeah. Uh, he's he's a combo guard, obviously, but he can certainly, he, he can handle the ball, right? Now, he's long in the tooth, but um, he's got great experience. So, yeah, I mean, that would somebody, that's, that certainly would be somebody you'd have to, have to think about, and that that's the way this is going to go. That when there's a buyout guy that you're going to be able to get who can at least shoot a little bit because we still uh, we've talked about it forever. We definitely need another shooter. So I think those are pretty much all the names okay. worth mentioning there. Louis will join at the bottom of the hour. He is our final guest tonight on the uh, Borton Volvo guest lineup. Tomorrow, uh, Seifert joins, and um, Kessler. I'm assuming will be with us tomorrow. Both of them. Will, are scheduled to be in studio. We've talked almost no Super Bowl to this point, other than more general philosophical opinions about missing uh, professional football once the uh, the bowl goes, uh, you know, takes place on on Sunday. Um, we had a left couple leftover residuals on the uh, mass transit story that we were discussing earlier via a I think a press conference involving the chief and. Uh, you know, some new statistics about the crime being up in 2023, et cetera. This is out of the 612 area code. I was a Metro Transit bus operator for a year and a half. I drove a bus from 2017 to 18. I was very proud to complete my training. Looked forward to helping people to get to their destination safely. It was such a horrible experience. Rarely did I have a uniformed officer or undercover officer on my bus. I was worried most days if I was going to safely make it through my shift, uh, drivers were being assaulted all the time. Uh, libertarian guy writes, just speculating here, if those metro trains were run by private entities, there's no way these crime or payment issues would exist. Market forces would dictate otherwise. Unfortunately, these systems are likely not profitable and therefore are not taken up privately. Um, I don't know if that would make any difference. I, I honestly don't at this point. Um, I was on a full, rather full train in St. Paul a few years ago that got checked. Pleased to see that everyone had Indeed, pay. How do other mass transit cities deal with this? New York City, Chicago, et cetera. Well, they're all having various kinds of challenges post COVID. Yep. Um, I want to say there was just a story recently out of New York regarding the uh, uh, fare jumping uh, kind of thing. But I do think they've got more barriers and, and mechanisms. Well, you know, their, their mass transit goes back forever. Ours is still relatively new. So I think their infrastructure, uh, to a certain extent, might be better. But there have been lots of discussions and concerns about some of the issues there. So, no, this might not just be our problem. Now, some of our problems might be specific to here. But there are, um, you know, there are certainly uh, problems everywhere, different challenges, perhaps even of of, of a uh, different um, sort, a different type as uh, as well. Um, regarding mass transit, uh, the grand, grand, this was a few years ago. My cousin and I rode the light rail to U.S. Bank for a concert, not T Swift. There was no cup on the rail or outside the stadium. Uh, we could have gotten on without a ticket and survived. Well, again, you know, the, I, I don't even know what's realistic to expect about presence, but if this is pretty logical, isn't it? I think any sort of mass transit situation where there is going to be an interesting mix of individuals. When I say interesting, some who are there to ride, to go from point A to point B, others to get it out from the cold, others to do drugs, whatever the case, and others maybe to do some some bad things. There's going to be greater comfort if you see security of one sort or another, right? If you If there is a presence of security. The assumption also is that that discourages the bad guys, the scoff laws, from picking that occasion to decide to, you know, take advantage and go after a couple of people, unsuspecting people, correct? Doesn't that make sense? It does. It does. Um, but, as I said, it, it's it's a long game. You know, I mean, it, it it's, and I, but I don't, I'm, 
I'm weary of the COVID. Well, it's just everything's different uh, post COVID. Well, some things are, not the least of which that a lot of businesses, and this is an ongoing debate and discussion, are allowing their uh, employees, a, a large percentage of their employees, to work at home completely or the old, all right, well, you come downtown three days a week. The old hybrid method. Yeah, the hybrid method, exactly. But I, I, I don't think, I think it's too easy uh, to say, well, that that's it. That's the way anything, and there's not much we can do about that. No, part of what's discouraged, has discouraged numbers, is crime. <laughs> and just a, a sort of a sense of uh, creeping chaos, as I've called it before, that um, discourages people from feeling quite as safe, even if it's likely that they're not going to get mugged. That's human nature. I, I don't think that's anything that an average individual, especially if you have kids, you're traveling with kids, should in any way, shape, or form uh, be made to feel guilty about. We have uh, Louie coming up. Uh, we'll, we may get to some more uh, A-section stuff in the top of the hour. There's so much stuff that I've embargoed, but now we got time to get to all of it because we're very close to the uh, sports abyss. Are we close to the abyss for the Minnesota Wild, or have they already reached the abyss? We'll ask Louie that question. If you have questions for him or comments, and a few of our a few of you already have, hit the uh, Bradshaw and Brian Cafe and text line, which is six four six eight six. We'll play our game and find out if it was warmer today here or where Louis was, and we kind of already know the answer to it. Even if it feels like the numbers aren't quite We're as closing uh, the gap. as crazy, we've got some games in hand as they have. The end. The fan. Yeah. <laughs> Well, she sneaks around the world from Vienna to Carolina. She's a sticky finger filter from Berlin down to Belize. She'll take you for a ride on a slow boat to China. Tell me where in the world is Lou Nanny. Louie is indeed back with us, brought to you by Kemp's. He joins via the Connecticut. Water Systems Hotline. Luigi, I bet you the temperature gap from where we are to where you are is only, I'm going to say, 22, 23 degrees. What is your temperature? I don't think it's even that much. This is a cold day here today. It's only 68. Oh, yeah. After this, it's going to get warmer. Yeah, we had a cold day, a windy day. Or uh, our, our hearts go out Amazing. to you. Uh, we got up. What are yeah. we up to today, Garzi? 52? I've got 54 right 54, now. 54, and I think we're yeah. supposed to uh, approach 60 tomorrow. Well, tomorrow we're going up into the oh, 70s course. and then to the 80s. So You're back in Florida? Yeah, but it, we had a cold day today. <laughs> a little breezy, too? or it wasn't cold for me because I don't, you know, 68, 70, I love it. But uh, yeah. for the people that are down here for the sun, they'll be putting blankets on. Uh, if you have questions for Louie, in fact, we got one much earlier in the show. I'm scrolling down. This came in at uh, 5.01 and 48 seconds. Dan, I recently saw a photo of Louie skating with Derek Sanderson. Wondering if Louie has any good Derek Sanderson stories from another era of uh, the National Hockey League. Well, I could tell you one thing. <laughs> you know, Derek made a lot of money when the WHA came in. He was their highest uh, signing player after Holly, and he he made a million dollars. Went to Philadelphia, and and you know he ran through some tough times, lost money. He really spent a lot of it, and then he went back to Boston. But when he when he went back to Boston, he had you know he he still had some money, and I invited him to Duff's golf tournament years and years ago, the Duff's bar, you remember that, they used to have a big golf tournament, a celebrity golf tournament, they had actors and actresses coming in from Hollywood, and, and um, you know, sports figures, so I had Derek come in, <laughs> and he comes in, and he came right from Germany. And he had five guys with him. He he paid, he paid for their tickets. He just met him over there, and he comes in, and, and I, I, I greet him at the club, and I says, where are your clubs? He says, I don't have any. He says, you got a pro shop here? Yeah, of course. It's okay. Take me there. So he buys complete set of clubs, shoes, clothes, and that's it. So after he's finished, 
and the tournament was over. He gave away the clubs, the, the <laughs> shoes, the shirts, everything, and just left. Oh, I my God. I couldn't believe it. That's why he went through the money he went through. Uh, to your point, in the summer of 72, Sanderson uh, uh, signed what was then the richest contract in professional sports history. The Philadelphia Blazers of the new, the new WHA signed Sanderson to a five-year, $2.65 million contract that made him the highest-paid pro athlete in the world at the time. That included $600,000 in cash as part of the agreement, an offer that the Boston Bruins declined to match. How big was that story at the time? Oh, that was a huge story. That's what I that thought. Was, you know, Boston was, was a great team, and, and Sanderson was a terrific player. And and uh, for him to leave, the WHA was throwing money at some of the players. They had to get uh, credibility right away, and they started with Bobby Hull. But then they went on with Sanderson, with Cheevers, and a number of players. And, and Derek was a huge name uh, because he was flamboyant. Besides being a good player, he was he was a um, he had so much charisma and 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 so much magnetism to him that people, whether you loved him or hated him, you had feelings about him <laughs> one way or the other. That's and for sure. So he he was a guy that really was able to command a big dollar, and he did. And uh, he just. He just, unfortunately, at that time, his lifestyle wasn't very good. Really, it took Bobby Orr to really saved his life. Really? You know, he, yeah, oh yeah, he was, he ended up like in the, and he'll tell you, you know, and, and, uh, in Central Park and the parks and, and Bobby went and got him, and had him cleaned up and took yeah. care of him and got him back playing and, and, uh, they're very close even to this day and, and, and Derek, Derek's still around. He was working in the same business I'm in, in the financial business. But he uh, he he walks with a distinct limp. He's, he's you know uh, he's had some physical problems, but he still can play golf and still plays very well. Uh, I know. I, I one of the things I do is. Uh, you know, some of the money we manage for pension plans, big pension plans and union pension plans. And Jimmy Hoffa had a had a big tournament for years in Vegas where they'd raise money for uh, either Boys and Girls Club or I, I can't remember. There's so many charities I, I, I go to these events for. But he had Derek and Bobby come out there, and it was really funny. <laughs> you know, and in fact, they played with uh, Hoffa during the tournament, but... Uh, <laughs> He's he's a character. He, you know, he got involved with Joe Namath when uh, remember that's Bachelor right. Three. That's right. That bar. Yeah. yeah. Bachelor Three. Yeah. As an and investor. Bar, like yeah. Namath had one in New York, and yeah. And then uh, I don't think he put much money in. I think it was mostly his name. Right. And, and he and Namath uh, had the place in Boston. Uh, Two times Stanley Cup champion, and uh, Wikipedia reminds us that he uh, set up the epic overtime goal scored by Orr. That clinched the '70 Stanley Cup Finals, widely considered to be the greatest goal in NHL history. Is that the goal where the the stop action photo, uh, or is like is like he's he's parallel to the ground? He's like completely across. I mean, he basically his body. It almost looks like he's levitating as he's getting the goal. Is that the one that we're talking about here? Well, yeah, that's the one. But he. Uh the reason why he's levitating is because Noel Picard picked him up with a stick and flipped him. Mm. He'd already scored the goal. Okay. It was in the net. And then, and then Noel just lifted him right gotcha. in the air. And that, it was perfect uh, action shot. You could see the puck in the net or going through the air, as you said, levitating. And <laughs> Noel, Noel Picard standing be, behind him there. And he got the puck passed out to him. I think it was from the corner, if I remember correctly. And uh, right to Bobby, he come across from the right side and, and scored the goal. So the Wild finally returned to action tomorrow. I want to get to all that in a minute, but I do want to uh, uh, talk All-Star Game and All-Star Weekend with you. I am on record um, as saying, and maybe you and I have talked about this before, um, I did not watch a minute of the Pro Bowl proceedings. I did not watch a minute of the, the uh, NHL uh, All-Star proceedings. I will not watch a minute of the NBA All-Star um, Weekend as well. I understand why it exists. I'm not mad at people who want to watch it, but Louis, I, I, it's, to me, they've killed it. And maybe there's nothing that can be done about it. We know about all the money, and we want people to get hurt and all that. But you know what I know, that in several sports, hockey included, there was a time when there was at least the illusion 
that even though it was exhibition, it mattered more. Or it was it more closely approximated the regular season sport that you saw. And it doesn't. It doesn't in hockey. It doesn't in basketball, football. They don't even bother. You know, they, they just do flag football. So to me, it's uh, those events are all dead to me. Where are you on all that? Well, you and I talked about this, and, and I said, uh, you know, there's been an evolving uh, trend in all uh, sports, as you said, where the games have become meaningless. It used to be in hockey. That that used to be the best because you had Stanley Cup champs playing. That's right. Uh, an all star team. Good point. In football, they had the the. The, the champs of football playing the college all they did. back in my day. That's day. right. That, that Soldier was Field. Good game too. Soldier Field in Chicago, correct? Real game. Yeah. Yeah. They, they were real games. And then they evolved. Then you had, when, they, when the expansion came, then you went to two conference teams and they played each other. And, and it was a pretty good game, but there wasn't much physicality, although there always was somebody would body check somebody or hit somebody and, you know, you get a little route. Then it evolved into where it is today. And I have to tell you, I'm like you. I don't watch a game usually, but I, I will say this. It, it, if it wasn't for my wife, I wouldn't even watch a skills contest because I got so fed up watching it even last year with, yep. with the gimmicks they were trying, yeah. shooting off balconies onto the, onto the ice, stuff like that. Well, this year... The NHL finally made, and you know what they did? They took the players in, and the players wanted to do something that was meaningful, that looked like it was, you know, they really uh, it exhibited their skills and gave them a reason to play. And, and Matthews and McDavid were really involved in it. And the skills contest, they put up a million dollars for the guy, the player with the most points, essentially the best player in the world. And the skills contests this year were by far the best you've ever seen. They really competed in, in different skills contests. There was less gimmick. And there was part, no gimmick at all. Mm-hmm. There was no gimmick. That's the, that was the reason why it was so successful. Everything they did, there, there was no gimmick. They, they had to <laughs> compete. Unfortunately, even when you do that, you know, Kucherov uh, got off to a bad start, and after that, he's out of it, so he's going to be cut anyway. So he didn't really participate the way the others did. And so he got booed and, at the rink for it, and he's been getting castigated in the press and everything else for not m- not really playing the way he should have or trying the way he should have. The other guys were trying. They were working at it, yeah. you know. And then... Sunday afternoon, comes my wife said, we're going to watch a game. I said, I'm not watching that. I can't watch that anymore. And she said, we, we got to just watch. So I watched a couple of beers, and sure enough, it was, it was the same way it was. Uh, yeah, you know, in, in, the, in the final game was against Matthews and McDavid. So that's when I watched a, a period and, and uh, the last half. But it was, it was a little more competitive because uh, – it was those two guys, you know, Matthews in Toronto, McDavid, who'd won a million dollars the night before as the best player in the world, which he is. And they, they, their teams gave it a, a better effort, a better competitive effort. So it was somewhat uh, worthwhile to watch. But the skills, skills contest far and away was the best thing in the All-Star weekend. Um, I've got some text to get to. Wild uh, return to action tomorrow night. I think I, I don't know if we talked about this last week or not, but Garen was on with the Beyond the Pond crew the the Saturday prior. This was the day, the the wild. Did we talk about this? They played the Ducks, and they lost that game, if you recall. They blew a third-period lead for, the, I think, the second straight night. They lost that ball game, lost that puck game. And that day, Garen had said to the Beyond the Pond crew, it's a must-win for us. We're at that point now where it's a must win. And they didn't win it. So you know how it is. I mean, people get on air and they talk and sometimes they don't mean things literally. But here's my question. Do you think, because I know you've been calling for this for a while, but do you think it's likely that Garen has concluded that, yeah, I don't, I'm a competitive guy, but I, we're, we're, we've got to stop kidding ourselves here. Um, and if he is, how are we going to know it? I mean, is it something you think he'll proclaim? Is it a move that tells you, okay, they 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 realize now that their chances just aren't very good here, and they've got to think beyond this season. What what are we looking for for clues to find out if Garen meant what he said on that occasion, 
and whether even for him that was enough to say that's it. I'm crying uncle, even though I'm not going to maybe say that publicly for this season. Well, I don't I don't think he's at that point yet because even though he might have felt like it that day with that game, after that there were a couple more games played. The, the Wild went in, into their break. You get the All-Star break plus the team's got a few other days, and they and they stagger those. And, and the teams that didn't get it, were, and they're getting there later now with Nashville, St. Louis, Seattle. And wouldn't you know it, those teams – Went for just were brutal. Nashville loses two games. They, you know, they, they had a three nothing lead. One game they lose, and and when you look at the standings now, they they're not in a good position. The Wild definitely aren't in a good position. The way I figured it out, they not counting overtime wins or losses. Essentially, they got to go twenty two and eleven. I say that because they got thirty three games left, and I think that making the playoffs this year is going to be about six points less than it's been for the last four or five years. So that gives the wild hope. You know, you still have to cling to hope. And so as long as there's hope, there's hope Bill's not going to, Bill's not going to give up on that. And he, he knows it's going to be tougher. He realizes that. I don't think that even being in the position they're in with hope that he's going to try and do some big kind of move for the team to just make the playoffs and edge themselves in because, uh, as we stated before, he's going to have to give up assets that really he shouldn't be giving up at this time unless you, you're you going to be able to keep what you get on a contract. Maybe whoever you're getting has got a couple, two, three years left of the contract or it's someone that you feel and you better be right that you're going to get the equivalent back at the trade deadline if you don't, if you look like you're not going to make the playoffs. So I'm not expecting any major moves. He made a couple minor moves with two defensemen to shore up the defense where they are, especially with defensemen out. And then, you know, you need some some guys in Iowa because you had to move up Mermis. He's, I'm sure he's going to see her the rest of the year. Yeah. And, uh, and you have one other defenseman, Spurgeon, out for the year, so he shorted it up by getting two defensemen. But outside of that, I think he's just going to wait to see how they play in the next, my, I'd say, 10 days. She should be able to know more. And if they keep hanging in there, he's going to he's going to hang in there the same way and not try and do a big sell job right away, I wouldn't think. Uh, there's a couple of texters asking whether there is anybody on the farm that you are intrigued enough by that if indeed this, you know, ends up going pear shape, even more pear shape than it's been, um, that this club that you want to see them look at and that you think that they might look at? Well, you got a defense, uh, a couple of defensemen down there that they, they could land both as one of them. But I think where you're going to see what you'll probably see happen is, uh, and I can't even pronounce his name, Kostudinov or whatever the the Russian. Yes, I think you're going to see. I think you're going to see him here in March. If his team loses out, that's the guy, and and that's who I really want to see too. Because yep, uh, I think it's he, pronounced. He's is it pronounced? Good player. Is it pronounced Kuznetsov? Kuznetsov, I think yeah. something. I'm, that's yeah. my best effort. Somebody will correct us. Yeah, well, that's pretty good. I like that. And because yeah, you're off. Who's playing yes. extremely well for them? He he's not going to be able to come. His team looks like they're going to be in it. He just got two goals in two games again, and he's he's had an exceedingly good year. And I I know they're really excited about him. And uh, I I really believe there's a lot of hope he's coming next year. So they got those two guys. I think maybe even the Swedes going to come too. Mm-hmm. So they they got three good forwards that they're. Uh, very, very high on, and have been playing extremely well in their leagues. And I do believe the you know you're going to get excited about those three guys, and those guys you want to see. And, and defensemen, I watch them down there on uh, streaming their games, and and uh, they're good prospects. There's a couple of them there, but they they need more work. They need they need to to really learn how to play defense, you know, more yep. because. The closer you get to the net, the bigger the mistake, you know, and and you could get by with making those mistakes when you're forward, but when you're getting defense and you're giving up real good chances, and when you're goal goaltender, then you're giving up goals. So defense but takes a little while longer. Uh, That's t- why Brock Faber is such an, an amazing addition to the team this year. 
Izzy, uh, our old friend Izzy checks in from Vegas and asks what he thinks is an important question for you. We all know Gary Bettman is unhealthily obsessed with Arizona, but why in the hell uh, is the league even considering going back to Atlanta to fail again? Well, first of all, they're not going back to Atlanta, although they do think if they were going to expand with a number of a few teams, they do think Atlanta will be better this time, and the reason why, because they get a building in the right location. And that's that's everything in the world. That's why Phoenix has failed where it was. You could have a good building, but if it's in the right, the wrong location, you know, Phoenix's building was beautiful building, yep, right? But it's out in the, you know, in, in in an area where it was not high income area, and by the way, it was a long way from Scott. It might take you an hour and twenty minutes to get to a game. They're not going to come that often, so they really believe that. The people that are interested in getting the franchise for Atlanta, they showed where they're going to get the building, and the building will be in a good location. But before that, you got to deal with Salt Lake City's probably number one, Houston number two right now. And uh, and Gary's not in love with Phoenix. Uh, the, the team, you know, being where it is, it's just that the market is so good. you got five yeah. and a half million people right. in Phoenix now. You want to make it succeed there because you – all the incremental income that you're going to make from outside the hockey game itself, the TV rights, the merchandise, all that stuff can be really substantial if you get the following, which you will get if you put the team in an area near downtown or near Scottsdale downtown. And that's and that's where they're right now. They're looking like they got a, a deal going for some land. Marty Walsh, who is you know, the labor leader, and now he's the executive director for the Players uh, Association. He's not happy. He's pushing them. He's he's the best thing going right now for them because he's making sure those owners know he's ready to have the Players Association use some power to force a move if they're not going to give the players there a good place to play. Um, why, is Lake, why is Salt Lake City at the top of the list? Well, uh, it's just they they got owners there that are willing to commit. You know, you got mm-hmm. the basketball team, they get, and and they've been successful there. They got the building, and they think that uh, you know the income around Utah. <laughs> maybe that's why Deer Valley and Park City and all those places, you know, get so much money for the condominiums and houses out there. There's a lot of money in that area, and and it's big enough to have corporations and and supporting teams and and uh you've got the ownership that's been very successful in, in basketball they're behind it so they got the money to do it and they think that they could uh be real successful there and well, move right in quickly so when is expansion com- coming next well they got to take care of the phoenix situation right. first and and gary's just resigned a couple of years i i i see before he retires and i think he's 70 now and before he retires, I think you're going to see another expansion of what. And I, I wouldn't doubt if it was two teams, because you, you know, you got to keep. You got 32. You got to go to 34. You go to 33, then, you know, you got one conference out of balance, and and I think they'd want to do two. But I think I, I really believe he wouldn't mind doing that before he leaves. Uh, t- another text. This is an interesting one. I don't know if I've ever asked you this before. A uh, Doug from Mankato writes. Has Louis ever had a chance to be hockey commissioner? And he uh, compliments you, saying you would have been a uh, a great one. Is that does that ever interested you, or ever come up, or ever been a possibility at any any well, significant first of all, level? I would be qualified. I mean, it, 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 I think, what do you mean? Uh, I think better businessmen than me. Why you I wouldn't have the opportunity? You, don't have, you know, the, huh? no. you wouldn't be qualified. No, I don't know if I. Guys, I think there's, you know, one thing about Batman. I will tell you this: mm-hmm. I've really got the respect of a great deal. When Batman's in the room, you know one thing: he's the smartest man in the room. Mm. Well, he'll tell you too. I mean, I, I, you know, he <laughs> might tell you that's okay, but yeah. he is. So that, <laughs> you know, I, I, <laughs> you know, there's. Uh, it, 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 he's done a marvelous job there. He's been there what thirty one years. Now. Yeah. I still it's remember. Amazing. When the league hired him, well, there was time. suspicion, was there not? Is the old all were getting the basketball guy, the guy that's not a hockey guy? There was a lot of, I think, even understandable yeah, suspicion on the front end. 
Well, not only that, Dan, if you remember at the time, he was number three. Remember, I think Silver was still number two behind Stern, right? That might be true. I don't like, recall. Gary was the third guy. Yeah, he was number three. And I'm and I was saying, why are we getting the third guy here? You know, what, what happened? The second guy's just waiting for Stern to quit. And and uh, and I uh, and I knew you know Stern was going to move on and and by the way Stern was as you know tremendous and he was a good friend of Gordon Gunn's that's where I got to know David but uh, I I'm I'm sitting there when they made the selection thinking that uh, we're getting a basketball game we're getting a number three in basketball yeah. I know you love basketball I heard your show there for a half hour before you guys should do a pregame show for the Wolves you're good. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't even you mentioned know. him today. Yeah. Now, Kevin, you didn't mention him today. I've been listening to you for 12, 20 minutes waiting to get on. It was all, oh. your, five, your five at five was all about the tw- Timberwolves. Well, no, the top. The, well, well, that was Garzy. Oh, Fawn sent you a, well, a, sent you an email? A yeah. text, and he's really upset. Yeah. Yeah, he, well, that, that wouldn't be surprising. He, you, he's mad at me about right, the candles. You, yeah. you have fans of both hockey and baseball, basketball, yeah. so you should be giving them time. That's great. Anyway, the um, that was a surprise to me. And the guy came out and he completely changed the way the league ran things, did things, even at the executive level and mm-hmm. board meetings, et cetera. He took complete control. So he, he definitely had a lot of confidence in himself. And he he's brought that league to you know heights that I never thought was going to get there. Yeah, there's no there's, there's no denying that part of it for uh, for sure. Um, anything else you want to get into before we go? That's already top of the hour. You got anything else you want to? No, uh, no I, I got to go eat. Stuck I in your cr- oh, little, nice little dinner. Beef and grill tonight. I got to go Ooh. for some fish. Outstanding, outstanding. That sounds. Usually I go for Italian so often, but I got to go fish. Get a little seafood tonight, huh? My second favorite was Chinese, and ah. and they got this blackbird place here. With uh, I went with my my son and some friends of yeah. theirs. Uh, they were visiting. That it. it was outstanding. I had I ate Peking Peking duck again today with was left over. Man. Now now you're gonna That's get cool. us all. See now we're all suffering from FOMO because we don't really. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's some nice restaurants here, but we don't have that opportunity now with palm trees swaying when we go outside. Well, I talked to uh, Andrew and uh, Gavin, you know Zimmerman and and mm-hmm. and uh, Casey, and, and they were the wild chefs on the trip. Ah. I was doing the wild games. Nice. And so they even, they even, we were going around, what, they were asking me what restaurants do I like down in, in Palm Beach. And they just, uh, you know, confirmed some of my. Some of your favorites. Of, uh, yes. So, <laughs> that I like. And I hadn't been to recently, so. Yeah, there you go. I've already made reservations for, for the other ones on the weekend. So. <laughs> Have fun. Enjoy the meal, the seafood tonight, and we'll uh, we'll chat next week. Thank you, sir. Okay, guys. Nice to be with you. Thanks. Louis, Luigi, uh, joining us, uh, brought to you by Kemp's, as he does each and every week. I've got some text to get to in our final half hour, a couple of other uh, controversial subjects. We're, as usual these days, going all the way until 630, so there's no... St. Paul, the fan. Reminder on this Big Ten Tuesday that the 2024 TIAA Big Ten Women's and Men's Basketball Tournaments are coming to Target Center March 6th through the 17th. Tickets are going fast. For more info and to purchase tickets, head to KFAN.com keyword calendar. Um, some stuff that we're probably going to get into with Kessler tomorrow, but uh, tonight yeah. by a vote of 2000, 214 to 216, Republicans have just failed to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. I think I'm pronouncing that name right. Um, this, you know, the impeachment of the week or the impeachment of the month to me is is, is just gotten so asinine. I've talked, and I'm certainly not the only one to talk about some of the failures of, of the Biden administration when it comes to border issues. The numbers are ridiculous. They are unprecedented. They are untenable. And eventually... Uh, now that it's an election year and even some Democratic mayors said, we got a problem here. This influx is is damaging our infrastructure. You're getting some acknowledgement finally. So there's vulnerability on the issue. But impeachment, no, this isn't an impeachable offense. If you disagree with the policies, that that's that's our problem. 
The whole thing is so stupid. And in the end, you don't get the vote you wanted. I think it was four Republicans who voted with the Democrats to defeat it. And all that effort, and you don't even get it, is such a, 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 a black eye to Republicans. It doesn't make any sense to me. By the way, also, the, the, the bill that was gaining some momentum um, on the Senate side is dead, as I understand it as well. I believe that's now dead on arrival for, for uh, uh, regarding border security that a lot of people thought had some, some st- it's the old, it's the old look. You're not going to get everything you want, but it's probably as good a deal as you're going to get. I even think McConnell basically made that point to uh, his Republican associates. And as I understand it now, that is probably dead on arrival. And now they're trying to come up with a plan B or or something different. All, all of this dovetails nicely with um, this was a it was a it was a New York Times piece. I, I spent a little time talking about it on Enough Set, I think a week or so, or so ago. Under the headline, this is why Americans are so cynical about politics. And the writer notes, the, the, the starting off point was this, there, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, late January there was a, there were some federal employees who had a protest at the Biden administration's support of Israel in the war against Hamas. And... um. There were some federal employees. They just they declined to work. They decided to not work for a day. Um, he notes that about at the same time at the Capitol, Republican members of the House were again threatening to throw their institution into chaos to prevent their leader from negotiating a spending package with the Dems. And he he says that these are not as unconnected as one, as you might think, even though they're on opposite sides of the so called uh, partisan divide. He thinks. They confirm and reflect a larger issue that um, is a fundamental flaw in the business that is being done at um, the nation's capital. He notes federal employees certainly have a right to participate in protests in their personal capacities. They have every right to resign their positions if they want to express strong disagreement with the policies of the administration they serve. Uh, But in this case, they organized a protest in their capacities as government officials, yet did so anonymously to avoid being held responsible. Uh, The writer notes, uh, this is not new. Uh, Late late last year, about 100 Democratic congressional staff members, many wearing masks to hide their identities, staged a walkout to, as some put it, demand that their bosses speak up for a ceasefire, a release of all hostages and immediate de-escalation now. Hundreds of Biden administration officials on that occasion sent a letter to the president in November uh, opposing his Israel policy without signing their names to it. Um, He he, he writes, you know, they didn't resign and inexplicably to him, they weren't fired. They just used their positions as federal officials to raise the visibility of their protests against federal policy. And you might say, well, what's so bad about this? Uh, he says, well, th- the problem with this is there's a difference between um, expressing private views and attempting to engage in making public policy. They were intentionally muddling that boundary. Their, viola- their actions violated the basic norms of federal employment and to the extent they constitute a labor action, perhaps even the law. And the point being, you're still working for who's ever in charge here that is has been voted in to implement policy. So there have to be limits if you want to stay in the job to how far you go in muddling private and public. But he says we shouldn't be surprised at this point. There should be no shock at this point, given that even in Congress... When we're talking about representatives and we are talking about senators, he says there's not that much interest in in policy at this point or legislation at this point. Show up at a high high profile congressional hearing and what do you get? YouTube clips, other social media posts, rather than opportunities for collective deliberation or 
debate. He says the House Republicans in this con- Congress have had much to do with the tendency of members to treat the House as a platform from, for commentary or performance art. And that these performances often use Congress not only as a stage, but also as a foil, treating the bargaining and deal-making that's supposed to be the essence of legislative work as a form of corruption. So the result is, if you're looking for clicks, if you're looking to go viral, even as recently as all the lecturing for with great sound bite drama, this bite sound or drama effect, when all the big shots from Facebook and Insta and you know the uh, you uh, uh, TikTok showed up for the congressional hearings, they all get yelled at. At the end of the yelling, what do we really have? Maybe it didn't matter to those who were doing the yelling because they had their uh, sound bites. He notes that some of these folks don't even deny it. Your guy, Matt Gates, Republican out of Florida, asked by a reporter a few years ago, he's concerned that he was gaining notoriety outside Congress rather than influence in it. His answer, what's the difference? People have to know who you are and what you're doing if your opinions are to matter. And he says, yeah, the outsider yelling at the system can speak some truth to power, but at the cost of having no power. Such people play an essential role, especially in the face of dangerously disconnected elites. Um, And the idea, once again, is are you in this to actually try to be adult enough to get legislation accomplished, to to get work done, to govern, to make deals? Even if it means you don't get everything that you want, you get enough of what you want to say, this is as far as we can take this particular fight. And we all love the Maverick. I love the Maverick. I mean, we all do. The, it's a, ah, they're all, get them all out of there. But the problem with that, again, after the, the adrenaline rush of it is, do you even, should we even trust the people who say that? I'm the Maverick, and I'm not going to play by your rules, and we need to start over, et cetera, et cetera, because... A lot of times with them, there's no there there other than they are living for those viral moments. They are living for, did you see me on YouTube? Did you see me on Insta? Got picked up by TikTok? And at the end of the day, the people I think who lose uh, tends to tend to be the uh, the citizens. And that's, I think we're seeing that again with the Republicans on this deal. Let's, you mentioned this on the TV show. The Dems can be blamed, I think, rightly, of, all oh, you're interested in the border now because you see there might be some political ramifications. That's not, a, that's not a good reason. That's just political. But what we're seeing from the Republicans who've been crying about this for a while is that at the moment where the Democrats, for whatever the reason, came to the table, now it's, no, 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 no. The Godfather has spoken. Donald J. Trump has said the last thing he wants is any kind of meaningful border deal being done before the election. He wants this issue for the election, and he wants to be the one that's going to get credit for it if something gets done later. So we're going to stop doing the due diligence to try to come together to get some meaningful legislation done, because we've been telling you it really needs to happen. This is a matter of national security. This is important stuff. But that's so important that we can't now drag our heels and say, no, 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 no. I I'm kind of meant what I said, but we'll, we'll get to it eventually. So you end up, again, being about what? Performing. You're about, in this case, performing in a way that Donald J. Trump is um, uh, will reward later and pat you on the head and maybe get, may get you a couple phone calls so you can get aroused by the fact that I got a call from Donald Trump. It all feels like uh, performance at this point. That's why it's hard to tell the difference between um, legislators who are attempting to get something done and and are um, and by the way know that in doing that they're not going to get everything they want, but they might get something. And and these folks who just come off as as I said, performers and actors as well. Uh, let's get a final pause in. We'll come back, get to a couple of texts, and wrap up. Three KFAN. It's the Bumper to Bumper Show Wrap. I would like to highly recommend that each and every one of you podcast, if you missed it the first time around, or maybe even if you didn't, 
the three o'clock hour of the program. We were joined by best selling novelist Terry Hayes. Um, he's got a new book out called, it came out today, official release today. It's called Year of the Locust. If you love geopolitical thrillers, if you love a Vince Flynn kind of a novel, and, and, and you like a guy who's kind of carved out his own niche, now, 10 years apart, because his first book of this sort, called I Am Pilgrim, came out 10 years ago. We uh, interviewed him then, and uh, we got back to him today, and he told a really interesting story about how his process works and why it took him so long to get back into the saddle and to write this second book. A lot of it very personal, very tragic, and then also in some ways very inspiring about what he vowed to do. At a time where he felt very vulnerable about family for reasons he gets into, he'll note how much, how important it was to him to be present for his children in a way he did not want to regret down the road. And he tells us a little bit about the process, about what the book is about without giving away too much, so you don't have to worry about any spoiler alerts. I was very respectful, and he was as well, about not giving away too much. But it is definitely worth your time. It was a good almost 30 minutes with him. That was between 3.30 and 4. Louie is always outstanding. He joins. Although I got the vibe that Louie was bitter. We didn't start him at 5.15. Well, maybe we'll start him at 5.15 again. He seemed a little bit... I don't know if it's the fallness influence. A little bit. Might be a little bit of that. Fallness poisoning the well. He tends to do that with a lot of people. Uh, but whatever. We had good stuff from Louie at uh, 5 o'clock. Or I should say at five between 5.30 and 6. A couple programming reminders for tonight. Fan on Demand is going to follow us. And then uh, Golden Gopher men's basketball. Gophers Michigan State. And some of you may not have, uh, may not be able to get it on TV. This is a uh, Peacock game. It's on Peacock. As a result, radio might be your only choice. So it's on the fan, FM 100.3 and via the iHeartRadio app. If you're interested in the Timberwolves tonight, go to the Timberwolves channel via the very same app. Unbelievable. And it'll be the uh, Wolves in the Windy City taking on the Chicago Bulls. Wolves, Bulls tonight on the Timberwolves channel via the uh, iHeartRadio app. Tomorrow's program includes Kevin Seifert in studio. We'll talk football, a lot of Super Bowl, and uh, whatever new Vikings steam he might be able to come up with and concoct. In addition, tomorrow we expect Kessler, both of them in studio. Kessie in the 5 o'clock hour. Seaford is at 4.30, did you say, or 4? He is at 3.30 tomorrow. 3.30 tomorrow. Okay, 3.30 in tomorrow. Studio. And uh, we'll go uh, lengthy with him as well. We expect... He said we're shooting for 3.30 is what he said. Oh, okay. He's got a lot going. He's right. Kevin Seaford. How much could he have going at this point? A the Vikings aren't going. doing anything. Probably getting ready for UFL coverage. You oh, know he's going to yeah, have a lot to do you're probably right. That. Uh, Salisbury Thursday, Gary Myers now confirmed for Thursday. So uh, there'll be good uh, Super Bowl conversation and football conversation before this uh, this week is wrapped up. And, of course, the big game can be heard on the fan, I'm assuming, on Sunday, correct? Westwood won? Got to be. Looking at it right there. Yeah, it's got to be. Right after go for basketball at Iowa. Ooh. Fran's red face? Fran's red face. They're not very good here either, are they? They're okay. just sort of, they're all, just, everybody's in the middle, other than, like you said, Purdue and maybe Il- Illinois. Yep. Other than that, it's just a mishmash. Not that much difference between 14 and 3, is there? So handle Izzo tonight. Take care of it tonight. Yeah. Get yourself a little separation. I heard he might wear a suit tonight. And that I, now I'm worried, yeah, because if he, if he goes back to that button-down look. It's all business. I don't think he looks quite as commanding on the sidelines in the jumpsuits and the sweatsuits and all you that stuff. You notice how short he is. I, I, you, 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 you're kind of like kidding, but I think you do. Yeah. I Joe think Pesci, you do a little bit. Danny DeVito. Does he use a stool? I don't there know. There are no stools on the be- uh, up, up on the raised part anymore, right? Oh, people bring them up. Do yeah. they still bring oh, yeah. them up? They don't always sit on them. For the coach? Mm-hmm. Okay. They bring them up. Good to know. I walked through the Izzo Hall of History yesterday. Was it impressive? By the way. Yeah. Yeah. There's a few things there, a few artifacts. A lot, a lot of trophies. A lot. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for texting. And uh, we'll start it all over again tomorrow at 3. I'll be there. I'll-